Hello everybody from the Loyal Jones Appalachian Center at Brea College. This is Head of the Holler. Tonight, actually, we're not in the Appalachian Center on campus. We're here in my home where we've just had a supper with my friend, Mr. Jonathan Burgess, who is here traveling with some colleagues of his, putting on a stage production called Fair Fall Ye USA, which in Ulster Scots means Hello USA. So I'm really pleased to introduce Mr. Jonathan Burgess to you all. Thank you. Jonathan, welcome to Head of the Holler. It's very pleased to be here. Thank you, Chad. Yes, it's great to have you. We've been talking about this uh, production for a long time, so it's great to have you in the States. It's great to be here at last, like I say. It's been two years in the That's planning right. this production, so it's, it's fantastic to That's be right. here at last and be sharing this stuff with you people. Right. So the, the play that you've written and directed, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's produced by Blue Eagle Productions. Mm -hmm. Um, the play examines the influences of what in the U.S. we would call Scots-Irish culture mm -hmm. in Appalachia. Yes. Tell us about it. Well, really, the, the most significant point that we're trying to, to bring to the attention of folks here is, is the term Sc Scots-Irish. It's actually the term Ulster Scots, which is the, the term that we would use back home. Uh, Ulster Scots means Scots-Irish. Uh, and really, uh, Ulster is the most northerly province of Ireland, uh, known more commonly today as Northern Ireland, the country of Northern Ireland. Uh, and, and what we're looking to do is, is just be a wee bit more precise, a wee bit more exact about where those people who came and were the frontiers people uh, in Appalachia actually came from and the part of Ireland that they came from. So this play has, has been created to do that. Um, and we're looking to, to come here and share that with you folks. That's right. Now, in the U.S., we hear a lot about uh, what some people call Scotch-Irish mm -hmm. or Scots-Irish. Yeah. But I even understand when uh, people were coming into Appalachia from, from uh, Ulster Scots that they would never have used the term Scots-Irish at that time to describe themselves. That was a later. What we see here as Scots-Irish was a much later term. Mm -hmm. So tell me, about, tell me about some of the people that you describe in your in your production being from from this land from whence you come <laughs> exactly well i mean re really i suppose as you go back to the genesis of of the project initially this was a show which was commissioned by the ulster scots agency called fair for you which which is as you say is the ulster scots for hello uh, and what that looked at was the movement of people from scotland from lowland scotland into ulster and northern ireland around about 400 years ago, the same time that Jamestown and what have you was getting planted in Virginia and what have you. So at the same time as people were coming to the States, there were people going from Scotland to Ulster. Um, and it tells that story there. The original show just tells the story of, of the movement from Scotland to Northern Ireland and the culture and the people that have grown up around that. That show went on to become the most widely seen and widely performed show in the history of Northern Irish theatre. Wow. It played to over 50,000 people uh, in over 355 different venues. Obviously, we're talking about scales, and somewhere like the United States, that may not be as significant, but to go back home and, and play effectively to one out of every 30 of your population is quite a significant number. It's incredible. Of, it is. It's, it's not bad. I think it would equate to something like 12 million people here for a stage show, which is, which is super. So... Um, what the Ulster Scots Agency decided to do with Tourism Ireland and also the Northern Ireland Bureau in Washington, they decided that because this had been, this had proved so successful back home and becoming a, a, a first touch, shall we say, for people coming to experience the Ulster Scots culture, uh, that they would export this to America. And instead of looking at the movement from Ulster to Scotland, the show then looks at the movement from Ulster to Scotland to America. Uh, so we, we start off, the, the, the first show, the original show, and this show start off the same. They start off, uh, they, they have the same premise. There is no, shall we say, great narrative driven piece here. It, it really is episodic meetings with characters through time from the early 1600s to the early 2000s. Uh, and what we're looking to do is, is show that, that length, show that line all the way forward or all the way back, depending on how you want to view it. Um, from the likes of Sir Hugh Montgomery. Sir Hugh Montgomery was one of the first people to plant Ulster in the early 1600s uh, and he brought an, a great number of Scots to Ireland and, and that's when the fusion of the Ulster and the Scots 
really happened on an official level. Not on an official level, that makes it sound very contrived, but on a on a um, on any kind of meaningful and substantial level which could then go on to sustain a culture. Northern Ireland and Scotland have always had very close links. They're only 13 miles apart. And if you look at the island of Ireland 400 years ago, it was easier for a man to travel east to Scotland than it was to travel south to somewhere like Dublin or Cork because of the amount of forests uh, and, and just the, the terrain on those days. So you had a, a better link with Scotland than you had with the rest of Ireland. Um, so we start this show as well with Sir Hugh Montgomery. And then the show goes forward to the Siege of Londonderry, which was one of the most significant um, moments in British and European history, uh, which was when Londonderry, where I'm from and where the company is based, um, held out for 105 days, the longest siege in British military history. Uh, when James II, who had been deposed uh, by Parliament because basically he had wanted to get rid of Parliament, get rid of democracy and return the the British stone to a very autocratic Catholic monarchy ruled uh, state. He raised a Catholic army in France with the head of uh, with the assistance of Louis the Fourteenth. Came to Ireland, landed in Ireland, marched north to the gates of Londonderry, and really to hold Londonderry at that time was to hold Ireland in terms of using it as a backdoor, a jumping off point into uh, Great Britain, Scotland, mm -hmm. for example. His plan was then to march down through Scotland and gathering a greater army as he went until he would have had an irresistible force when he would have arrived in London. Mm -hmm. He would have established himself and Britain would have had a Catholic monarchy, mm -hmm. which it has had a Protestant monarchy from, mm -hmm. from then to now. Uh, for example, the term hillbilly, which is very resonant out here. The billy in that refers to King William of Orange, who was the king who defeated James at the Battle of the Boyne the year after in 1690. So again, there's a nice tie there. That's the point when we leave Northern Ireland and we come to America. Uh, we meet the Reverend Francis McKemmy. McKemmy was um, a Presbyterian minister. And in Ulster and Northern Ireland in those days, Presbyterians were persecuted. It was the Anglican faith, the Episcopalian faith, which ruled and anything else that, that did not fall under its regime was discriminated against. So a lot of Presbyterians left Ulster at that time to come here. And one of the very interesting things about McKemmy, which I tried to put into the show, but it was very complicated and convoluted, was the fact that um, he was invited to preach in New York. Uh, and the governor of New York uh, basically took him to trial because he didn't have a license for preaching. Um, and McKemmy won the case, but was still made to pay for his own defence. And at that stage, the legislature uh, in New York decided that no man, if he was taken up to a court and was found to be proved innocent, must ever be responsible for his own costs. And that's where that mm. significant uh, aspect of American legal legalese came out of, or, or legal uh, legislation came out of. So that's, that's again, not, not because of him, but he was the man who they realised, well, this really isn't that fair. So therefore, we shall uh, we'll change that and make mm -hmm. sure that nobody is responsible for their own costs if they're if they're an innocent man. Then we head for Appalachia and the Frontiers Woman uh, and Davy Crockett, two characters who appear in the story. And um, one of the Frontiers Woman um, harkens back to Ulster, but she tells the Mary Draper Ingalls story, mm -hmm. which is a very mm -hmm. resonant story both in Kentucky and in Virginia. Right. And as we were driving here from, we had come from Stanton previously, we'd performed at the Frontier Cultural Museum in Stanton uh, at the weekend. Whenever you're driving across from there, particularly to Charleston in West Virginia, the terrain is just unbelievable. Stunning, isn't it? It is, you, you look at it and you go, how could somebody have walked across this? Mm -hmm. How could somebody have crested a hill and gone, look what's in front of me? Because mm -hmm. that's all you do is you crest the hill, the hill and there's another one. <laughs> And it's an ocean of mountains. It is. It gets a little flatter once you leave Charleston to a certain extent. But I mean, that drive over from, from Stanton uh, through West Virginia is, is unbelievable. And you really appreciate that the effort that that lady went through to get herself home after she'd been, she'd been captured. And again, that was the pioneering 
spirit. And a lot of these people came from the Ulster Scots uh, community and the Ulster Scots people. A lot of, say, you Catholic Irish would have stayed along the eastern seaboard, right. the likes of Boston, the likes of um, maybe Maryland. New York. Yeah, but for some reason, the Ulster Scots, maybe they just didn't like anybody very much and wanted their own, their own hell to fall, you know, to be... To, to look after them and uh, well we uh, like to essentialize them and say they're independent well yes exactly i mean that's i would agree entirely with that um i also know the culture that i come from as well uh, and they can be funny at times but it, it, it's a good thing and dogged, it's a, maybe? yes dogged thran um single-minded uh, and definitely not somebody to to fall out with um as is embodied in somebody like Davy Crockett. Mm -hmm. Davy Crockett, who stood at the Alamo uh, and was a senator for Tennessee, I believe. Right. Um, against, again, at the Alamo, uh, big odds, and that mirrors the Siege of Derry. Mm -hmm. okay. <clears throat> so that, that allows nice us to connection. come in. A lovely connection. So we have all this discovery going on. <clears throat> the central character in the production is a guy called Billy Wilson. And Billy... The, the whole the, the device by which we get to show these characters is that Billy has been writing a history paper and he hasn't done very well, but he's an aspiring football star. And mm -hmm. if he doesn't do well in this history paper, he's going to fail the year. If he fails the year, it's going to be detrimental to his, his ongoing football aspirations. So Billy gets one more chance to write his essay for the year. And it's who am I and where do I come from? Mm, nice. and, and really, these characters come to help Billy aspire to what he can be and help him understand his culture and where he comes yeah. from. And the last uh, character that we show in the play is Woodrow Wilson, President Woodrow Wilson. Mm -hmm. uh, again, a big resonance there with Stanton in Virginia. Um, because of the 44 presidents of the United States, 17 of them have got Ulster Scots connections. Interesting. Um, going from the likes of Jackson, Polk, Buchanan, uh, I mean, President Buchanan said that his Ulster blood was his most priceless heritage, um, which is probably the most essential mm -hmm. thing you can say about yourself. So really, that's that's an opportunity which uh, we have to show how a lot of these men moved on and moved up and took that, thra the, the thranness, the single-mindedness, the, the driven aspect of their personalities and their characters to... Um, to get as high as they could be. Right. Because of only, there were 17 presidents, but only one vice president. So these guys obviously like to go all the way. Yeah. Yeah, it was Vice President Calhoun. Yeah. Um, so th there are all these lovely aspects which merge and mix and mingle into that uh, Appalachian culture and into the Ulster Scots culture as well. So that brings us to the point of why we're here. Right. We're here to share this uh, and we're here to make those connections. Mm -hmm. 40 million people in the United States today would claim to have Irish in their ancestry. Of that 40 million, over 22 million would actually be Ulster Scots. Mm. Mm. So we're not here to belittle people's perception of their own culture, but we're here to allow those people who come from that culture to learn a wee bit more about themselves and perhaps attach themselves more to that culture and that heritage than they would previously have been able to do. Right. So we've had great fun. Uh, we were in New York for eight days uh, in the Vanderbilt Hall in Grand Central Station as part of a, a huge Tourism Ireland exhibition with many other people from Northern Ireland. Um, <coughs> and as I said, we came down to Stanton and we were at the, the Farmer's Market in Harrisonburg on Saturday and then we performed twice at the Oktoberfest uh, in the Frontier Cultural Museum. We're here with your good selves and we're very fortunate to have the opportunity to have some of our characters out at the, the Mountain Day right. today, which was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Sure. Uh, and we have a lovely performance space tomorrow in the, the Woods Pen uh -huh. Commons right. uh, in, the, in Berea. And then we head off to Maryville for their homecoming festival down mm -hmm. there and we have a, a, a lovely opportunity to perform in their new Clayton Arts Centre right. uh, in Maryville. And then we're back home to Northern home. Ireland. So, so yeah. uh, Appalachia was really, um, at least in the antebellum era, it was a, a triracial society. I think we sometimes we forget that uh, mm -hmm. in the U.S. and in Appalachia, uh, a triracial society between African American and Native American and European American. 
Um, but this is really a fascinating look at the European American influences. I, I should say when you were talking about Sir Hugh Montgomery, I'm going to reveal my own ethnic background. My my uh, maternal grandfather's name was Hugh, right. and my paternal grandmother's maiden name was Montgomery. Wonderful. So um, I think you're talking about my uh, ancestry and my heritage in Appalachia as well. So that's uh, wonderful. I, <clears throat> I really can't wait to see the the production. So when you were writing, um, when you added the USA to mm. Fair Foggy, um how much did you know about Appalachia before you started delving into the history, Jonathan? <clears throat> Nothing really, and I mean, I suppose that would be the converse of this. I mean, we, we were lucky enough to, to, sh to preview the show a few times in Northern Ireland before we came out, um, and really to do the job here in terms of strengthening the Ulster with the America as, as we got to do back home, which was nice. I mean, I was very fortunate enough to be, to be guided by a lot of very helpful people. I, I did a recce on the show uh, in December 2008, which shows you how long this has been going. Um, I met with the likes of uh, Grace Edwards from Radford, and I was right. in an Appalachian um, conference in Washington, D.C., and mm -hmm. I was in uh, Blacksburg and Virginia Tech, mm -hmm. and down to Maryville as well, and in Stanton. So I, I got a real sense of the connection there and really it was a question of what you put on it and, and what you left out mm -hmm. uh, you know we've had a lot of headline characters and a lot of headline scenarios for example the presidents Davy Crockett Mary Draper Ingalls you know trying to trying to make it pertinent to the places we're coming to uh, because you could probably write a different version of it for every two or three states right. across the United States right. because the Ulster Scots movement has gone, I mean, 10% of people in California, for example, have an Ulster Scots connection, mm -hmm. which is a long way west. Um, so I knew, I knew very little about Appalachia, um, and I've grown very sympathetic to uh, a lot of the stuff which people are endeavouring to do here. Um, people tend to to deal in stereotypes and in some cases cases crass stereotypes um, and I've been very fortunate to be able to come here and, and find a very warm a very inviting a very hospitable people I mean here we are in your home this evening and again in Stanton and in Maryville people are looking to right. to look after us and be very kind to us and very good to us and guide us uh, as best they can and give us as many opportunities as we can and we're obviously very keen to give them as many opportunities to have mm -hmm. access to us as, as humanly possible as well while we're here. Right. I think for a long time in Appalachian studies we um, hung our hat so to speak on distinctiveness. Right. We, um, I think we projected an image that we were so distinctive in is insofar as U.S. regional culture, that we ultimately, I think, did so at our peril. And uh, just maybe in the last uh, 20 years or so, we've begun to explore much more the similarities mm -hmm. that we have in Appalachia mm -hmm. with other global rural cultures. Mm -hmm. um, so, so people have, have explored Welsh connections, the Ulster Scots influence is strong. Mm -hmm. um, we're even uh, involved in a little exchange at Berea between uh, the Carpathian Mountains and mm -hmm. its culture, Hutsulian culture in Ukraine, Western Ukraine. Wow. Very many similarities. So I wonder, as you've been exploring Appalachian history and the connections to Ulster Scots mm -hmm. uh, heritage, and now that you're here, mm -hmm. smack dab in in the region. Do you see similarities? I do. I mean, I even hear similarities, it must do be you? said. Uh, I, I can hear a lot of words, you know, that, that people would that would use back home. And, and the fact that if you're in somewhere like New York, you might say something and people cock the head and they, they wonder if they've heard you right and where are you from? Are you from Sweden? Uh, at least everybody gets as close here and says Scotland or, mm -hmm. or Ireland or somewhere. We don't have the traditional Irish brogue. Mm -hmm. uh, so therefore, that, I think that maybe throws people off the scent initially. But I have heard aspects of my own accent and other people, uh, especially coming through uh, West Virginia mm. uh, and, and in Kentucky as well. And again, even down as far as Maryville, I mean, when I was there with a, a gentleman called Robert Hutchins, who runs the Clayton Arts Centre, you know, and Robert was talking about various words which, which were used in his house when he was growing up, you know, which are just 
they're not even derivatives. They are the words that are used in the Ulster right. Scots um, language. And again, the problem which of how those words are perceived here and how those words are perceived back home as they're perceived as lazy English, which they aren't. Mm -hmm. They are, I mean, English is the most hybrid language in the world, probably, because everybody's had a go at adding to it. Um, but the Ulster Scots language, you know, for example, uh, read out. If I said to you, the read out, it means something needs to be cleaned out or we need to get out of here. And that would be understood. That was the term that Robert used to me. And I understood that. Now, that is, that's just a direct lift. That's something that he uses in Maryville, Tennessee. It's something that we would use back home in London, Derry, Northern Ireland. So, therefore, that came from somewhere. Right. You know, and it was obviously brought as part of the culture, part of the, the language that came and has survived over 300, 400 years to this point today, where it is still a viable, active part of the language. You know, so I would encourage people from Appalachia to branch out and explore their culture and as you say i mean if there are aspects in the ukraine and, and in europe europe and, and wales and, and certainly england as well um to explore those and make those links and make those connections and and hopefully uh, some people who will be watching this in the future will have come and seen the show and will have started to get those links and all we're looking to do is scratch the surface all we're looking to do is say maybe you can have a look at this maybe this means something to you and even I suppose the bare minimum I'm looking for is that somebody comes and sees the show and knows that Scots Irish is actually Ulster Scots after the hour is up, then that's enough for me. Yeah. So, uh, but there's a lot more in there and people can take much, much more from that. And like I say, the Ulster Scots Agency are online um, and in terms of discovering your name and your heritage, you can go onto their website and they have huge lists of names so if and we you google ulster scots agency we'll, we'll you, find the website you find that i think it's www.ulsterscotsagency.org okay and if you if you put that under your search engine they have a huge research and they're continuously adding to it uh, and there's names and you go and you find those names and you click on them and they'll tell you how that came from scotland or came to ulster i mean it's a fascinating process and, and project mm -hmm. you know um you know, and it's in there and people should, should make use of it. And then um, that, that's the first step. I think maybe the next step is to get over to uh, Northern Ireland and see the land. <laughs> I'm sure Tourism Ireland would be delighted to hear that. I mean, Northern Ireland has come through its troubles. There's no point in, in not mentioning that. Over the last 30 or 40 years, they've been very well documented and highlighted in the newspapers and on the television. Um, there is a new beginning happening there. Uh, to a certain extent, the, the slate has has been wiped. Uh, and, and, and you're uh, hopeful? Oh, always hopeful, always hopeful, always optimistic, and always trying to smile. So therefore, uh, we, we, we hope to, uh, you know, we have, a, we have a blank canvas to paint upon uh, in terms of drawing people to Northern Ireland. You know, we have got Derry's Walls, we have the Giants Causeway. I mean, Northern Ireland is, I think, approximately one-fifth the size of the state of Virginia. It's a very, very small place. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have two of the World Heritage Sites there, mm -hmm. in the Giant's Causeway and in the walls of Londonderry, which are the most complete set of city walls anywhere in Europe. So that's a fantastic draw for people to come. Um, and, and, and that would be my aim. That would be my aim to encourage that conversation. Well, it's people from Northern Ireland coming to Appalachia or people from Appalachia going to Northern Ireland. I don't really mind because I think everybody can benefit from each other. And I think that those strong links are there for people to, to make those connections. And, you know, we're like forgotten cousins to each other. And I think it's maybe time that somebody picked up the phone and did a That's bit of calling right. around. Right. Well, the play is called Fair Fall You USA, Hello USA uh -huh. in Ulster Scots. And uh, it's you've got, done your Appalachian circuit, so to speak, in yeah. Stanton and Berea and then Maryville. Mm -hmm. uh, might there be a sequel in our short few minutes? There, that we have there, there may, there, I would love for there to be a sequel. I would love to develop this. I would love to develop a relationship with the people that I've met. Um, there are so many Presbyterian historically Presbyterian institutions of higher education in, in throughout Appalachia, I yes. think that would welcome, um, you know, a, such a, a production. 
I would I would love to bring it to them. I would love people to I'd like as many people to see this as have seen it back home. Um and if if we can do even a small percentage of that, we'll see what happens. But hopefully whenever we go home next week, we'll have left a good impression with everybody here and the people who have seen the show and they will place worth on that and maybe Great. they'll look for us again. Well, we know how to say hello in Ulster, Scott, so how do we say goodbye? Sonsi for you. Sonsi for you. Yes. All right. Well, Jonathan, it's been a real pleasure to have you both in Berea and especially on Head of the Holler. I hope you've enjoyed our program. And as always, we leave you with a few highlights of the Berea College Bluegrass Ensemble. Thank you very much. Thank you.